So the format today is um, you're getting six topics. Uh, we're doing two topics each. They're 15 minutes long. So if there's something that doesn't really catch your attention, that's OK. You just wait a few minutes, and, and another topic will come along. But yeah, um, please uh, welcome on stage Nathan Yergler, who's going to be talking about how Eventbrite internationalized. Good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, as Simon said, my name is Nathan, and I'm a principal engineer here at Eventbrite. Uh, I've been here about three years. And uh, uh, my first topic this evening is around internationalization. And so what I want to talk to you this evening about is how Eventbrite um, w launched internationally, how we adapted our code base for international internationalization, and some of the things I think are slightly unique that we uh, developed as part of that. This is, this is sort of the story of how we took the site from looking like this, where we had um, some GOIP content and uh, there might have been some translations to looking something like this, where we have a mix of GOIP content. We have uh, content that's going to be relevant and featured based on what locale you're coming from. And um, we're really trying to serve up the events and the information that's going to be most relevant to our users. So the agenda for this evening is something like, what actually did we have to change in the site? What were those decision-making points we had to, we had to uh, decision points we had to uh, make? and uh, what the actual execution of that localization looked like. And finally, um, the lessons learned, or as I like to think about it, the uh, time machine dreams. So if we could do it over again, what might we do differently? So as an aside, as I talk this, this evening, I'm going to use the word locale a lot. And I just want to put this out here because it seems like it's a lot of confusion when we talk about translation. Locale is not a language. A locale is a language plus regional information, plus formatting information, um, how you do numbers, dates, all that sort of thing. So it's really important when you're doing internationalization to keep that in mind. So what did we do? We took the site from having some translation to having some um, facility for multi-language, and we fully localized the experience. So we let uh, our event organizers see information in their language. We let them customize what their event pages are going to look like. We um, started showing currencies the right way <laughs> with the correct decimal separators. Um, and, and kind of most importantly for our particular deployment, um, we, we, we were serving this on many TLDs. So that means that there's an eventbrite.fr that serves up our French site. There's eventbrite.de, uh, .co.uk, et cetera. And I think you'll see that that, that's, that decision in particular, that requirement that we had coming from as part of our product, was um, responsible for some of the complications and some of the, some of, some of the harder problems we had to solve. So there's some really inter interesting decisions you have to make when you're looking at localizing a large scale code base. Um, one of them is, what do anonymous users see? You know, it's easy to store a uh, pre preference for somebody who's logged in. But what does somebody anonymous see on the site? How do your, if you're going to do multi-TLD, how do they interact with, with locales? And um, that actually raises another question, which we'll talk about in a second, is how does authentication work? How does it work across all these different top-level domains? And finally, what is the canonical URL for a page? <laughs> so locales and TLDs, these are the decisions we really had to focus on when we were um, starting to lo internationalize Eventbrite and provide it in all these locales. Um, are all the locales going to be available on all TLDs? And how do you figure out what locale to show somebody? So there's really two different ways that people go about this that, that we evaluated. One was negotiation, where you look at the browser headers, you look at what languages you support, and you figure out what the best match is going to be. Um, this is what I'd done previously at Creative Commons when we were doing localization there. Um, the other way you can do it is sort of you know, best guess. So you're on the .de TLD, we're going to serve you German. Or um, so there's sort of this, you know, how, how, do they, how, do these things, how do these things get bound together? And what we decided on was actually sort of a, a, a mesh uh, or a, 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 a hybrid of the two. So Eventbrite maps locales to TLDs. This means that if you switch what your preferred locale is, if you say, actually, I want French Canadian versus France, French, um, you will wind up on a different top-level domain. And that seems a little funny when you, when you uh, say it that way. Um, 
but it, it, ha it just it simplified several other parts of, of the code base. And, and that was it was really purely a, um, a, tr a strategic decision at the time. Um, anonymous users get the TLD default. So this is, if you land on eventbrite.de, you're gonna get German. If you land on eventbrite.co.uk, you're gonna get British English. Um, unless you're in Canada, then you have special rules because Canada is one of the few top level domains we have where there's more than one official language in the country. So we, then this is the hybrid portion where we say, oh, you're in Canada, now we'll do negotiation, but we're only gonna negotiate between French and English. Authentication I mentioned earlier is an interesting, interesting um, problem with this sort of approach. If you can imagine, we're issuing cookies for eventbrite.com when we started this project. Those cookies obviously aren't gonna get served up to um, users who are going to eventbrite.co UK or eventbrite.fr. And so, and it's important that when you log into the site, you get redirected to your preferred top level domain so that you have ever, sort of get all the features you come to expect that are localized there. What we built was a single sign-on um, shim that basically, instead of doing a, just a straight-up redirect, this takes, takes a signed URL, um, makes sure that it's a le legitimate user that's logged in, invalidates their previous cookies, and then redirects them and issues new cookies um, for, the, for the new domain. Um, this is by far the most complicated part of this process. And uh, I'm happy to talk with anybody kind of afterward about it because it, it, it's very Eventbrite specific um, to how both, both how we do authentication, how we're doing our top level domains, and, um, and what the product requirements were. Finally, the other question we talked about was, you know, what is, what is the canonical URL for a piece of content? Um, at, the decision we made was that that top level domain, that canonical URL is gonna be controlled by the event organizer, so whatever their preferred top level domain is. Um, you, you know, we get a lot of our traffic from searches, people searching for you know, beer festival tickets, searching for dance, uh, you know, dance events, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's really important for us that we don't get penalized for, uh, search for, for having this content on multiple top level domains. You can imagine that if we served every event page on every top level domain, now we've got 10 copies out there on, the, and, and the, that um, SEO is spread across all of those and we're also penalized for it. So um, what we do is we, we end up redirecting everybody to the right place, um, which we'll talk about in a second. So how do we execute on this? We, uh, as, as Simon mentioned, Eventbrite started in 2007. Uh, we had a lot of legacy code around that we still operate some of and it interoperates with our Django code. So a lot of times we won't use the stock Django pieces directly. We'll use uh, a very similar version of a you know, subclass or something that um, slightly customized. And this is the case with our, loca with our locale middleware where it's very similar to the stock Django version but it, it kind of takes into account all of our uh, quirks and accretions over time. So this middleware uh, figures out what locale you should be in based on a few different factors and scribbles on the request. And I, this is a good time to point out that middleware is long lived. When we started um, doing this project, we, had it, we were in kind of a testing mode and what we found was people were getting the wrong content, the wrong language periodically. And this took a, we, we really were trying to figure out why, why this happened. It only seemed to happen when it was, in staging when things were under load, it wasn't happening on our, on our dev machines. Um, and what we found was that the person who had done the initial implementation had assumed that middleware was instantiated on a per request basis. And they had scribbled on the middleware as a po and assumed that it was symmetrically called. Neither of these things are true. Middleware's long lived. Never scribble on it. <laughs> so, um, the last thing this middleware does is activate the, lo the, the, the locale. And, I call this out because this is something we're, I'm gonna talk about a little bit uh, more as well. But this, this last line here, this translation.activate, this is what actually loads the translations up, loads up um, the, what we're gonna serve up to the users for their content. Um, and this is, this is cached pretty heavily. Um, I mentioned that users, that we use the user top level domain to figure out where we're gonna serve the event page from. This, because this is under user control, we have to make sure links don't break 
so this was another thing we had to do as we're executing this, is make sure that when you land on these pages, if you're on the wrong top level domain, you're gonna get redirected. You're not going to get, and you're gonna get redirected with a permanent redirect. You're not gonna get a 404. Um, the, those of you who've done internationalization before undoubtedly have seen the underscore function. This is sort of the traditional way people, um, they import the, the get text call, call to mark content for translation as underscore. Um, and this is what basically says, I'm gonna translate this piece of content. So we not only have Python, we also have Mako templates that we're using instead of Django templates. Um, and we have JavaScript, which um, Django thankfully provides this great get text uh, JavaScript uh, function we can use. And finally, we also have handlebars. So these are templates that we're using in our more modern JavaScript. And, um, and what we wanted to do is make sure this was really consistent for all of our engineers across the board. So making sure that there's a underscore, basically in every context you can call, um, that's gonna do the right thing. And in handlebars, for example, we have this, we just registered a helper that then maps this back to what Django does internally. Um, after you've marked th your content for translation, you need to extract it so you can actually send it to translators to work on. Um, the Django ha managed has a make messages command that will do the extraction from, I think from the stock Django, everything the stock Django does. It's actually been a long time since I used that um, in particular, so I'm a little fuzzy on it. I do know that it did not support handlebars and didn't support um, very easily some of our, like our Mako templates, for example. So what we're actually using, um, and I think works pretty well for a large scale site like ours, is PyBabel. Um, th this uh, has a few advantages. This is a library, um, at, you can get it at edgewall.org. It has a few great characteristics for us. It encompasses all of the localization information we need. So everything about date formatting, number formatting, currencies, um, it has all that information in it. And this is, while Django has a lot of that on its own, we have non-Django code that we're interfacing with, and so this is a little bit easier for us to sort of plug into both ends. It also supports these pluggable extractors, so we can extract where our translations are from all these different kinds of files. Um, in this case here, you can see we've defined a custom one. It ships with a whole bunch. We defined one for handlebars in particular, and then you kind of tell it, this is the configuration, you can tell it what um, different extractor to use. And, those, and this is sort of just the header for that extractor. Um, and what, and what you're seeing here is that, that, that header. And so it shows, all you need to do is define a function here that takes some file and then, in our case for handlebars, it's just a regular expression. Um, it's really not that complicated. It just has to yield out, yield out, and yield out tuples um, with the translation strings. Um, I mentioned that event pages, well actually I actually didn't mention this yet, sorry. Um, event, in addition to all these other customizations about locales, we had this legacy feature where event organizers can specify what language they want the Eventbrite content served in on their pages. So this adds like yeah, yet another level of customization we're trying, we need to support. Um, and this is actually really problematic because it means we have to s switch locales midstream, which opens us up to a lot of bugs. So what we did was we, um, I think this is pretty useful, making it really easy for engineers to do the right thing with their localization. Just a decorator that's gonna preserve the correct locale for you when you leave the function so that if you're writing a function that, if you're writing a method that um, you're gonna send an email for an event and it needs to be in a different locale, you're going to, uh, um, you're gonna use this function so that, what, that whatever calls next ends up in the correct language and they don't see sort of half the page in one language and half in another. Not that that ever would have happened on our site. Um, so, what are some issues that we encountered? Um, there are a lot of subtle bugs with the single sign-on approach um, that I think they're pretty much all resolved these days. I think. <laughs> but uh, it's like really hard. I mean, think about, you know, how do you unit test something uh, or write tests that are gonna really be switching between domains and make sure that the right cookies are both deleted and created? Um, it, it, it's, it's tricky. Um, the, the change in locales midstream also introduces a lot of complexity in the code. And finally, it's something we didn't talk about a whole lot, but when you're marking those strings for translation, you're trying to mark full sentences. Um, word order can be significantly different in different languages, and so sort of concatenating text together is, is a really poor practice. It almost will certainly break for somebody and, and read, at best, 
uh, awkwardly, at worst, completely gibberish. So retrofitting that sort of best practice, though, onto existing code is really hard. Um, and, and what we up, wound up doing was, set, was doing everything automatically that we could with uh, an automated tool we wrote, and then basically just fixing, fixing as we discovered them. The lessons learned, if, I, you know, if we had a time machine, I would ask really loudly, do you really need multiple TLDs? I, I don't know, but if you can get away without doing it, you're gonna say you save a lot of complexity. Um, we also learned that translators don't get the visual context for things. So the, um, we, we support you know, free and paid events, and that means we have labels on the site for buttons that say like free or paid. Well, which in English that's really obvious, or for most readers it's obvious in English, looking at the visual context for that. Um, in other languages where there are many words for free, for libre versus, you know, free as in freedom versus free as in cost, um, the translators don't get that, and so that le that's led to a lot of problems. And finally, um, start earlier. You know, we, we started this process after the site had been running for uh, like four years, four and a half years, and had grown quite a bit. And so that was um, really challenging and added a whole lot of complexity. Thank you very much. Thank you.